Good morning, everyone. How are you? <laughs> this is my friend Pam. Say, everybody say, hi, Pam. Hi, Pam. Your husband has his flash on and he's videoing us right now. <laughs> what a nerd. What a nerd. Um, Pam is, and her husband Brian are dear friends of my wife Stacy and I, and they're in town from Indiana. So thanks for coming. And she was worshiping, and I just sometimes let the Lord just sort of highlight the person that I should invite to read the scripture for us this morning, and Pam got tagged by the Lord this morning. So I dragged her out of worship and a moment of praise with the Lord to come up and read our scripture. So um, let's give her a hand as she does that, would you? Luke 12, 35 through 48. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and will have them recline at the table and he will come and serve them. But if he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom his manager will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant, whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him into pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant, who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did not deserve a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of much of him will be required, and from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well done, Pam. Good job. <laughs> Pam, do you hear that applause? I think you should preach here some Sunday. What do you think? <laughs> no, she says. Um, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Jeff. I'm one of the leaders here at the church, and it is a treat of mine to bring our Bible study time together with you. We're going to work through that passage. How many people think that passage is going to be an easy topic? Urgh, right? There's a lot going on in there, and it speaks to a lot of different things in the church. Um, and I want to run around in it for a while, and then I hope to have at least some pointed um, action steps for us that we can live into as uh, followers of Jesus. To get there, though, I want to set up this story. So years ago, my wife and I are first married. We've been married 28 years, I think, this November. It might be 29 years. Feels like um, 100. No, just kidding. Feels like feels like 20, whatever. But this is, we're married 28 years ago or so. Um, before we had kids, maybe, maybe we had a daughter. I don't know. It doesn't matter. We're around 30 years old or so. Um, and my wife's cousin, uh, her name was Becca, had just graduated from high school. She went to a small town school, and she was going to go off to either Richland or cosmetology school. I don't remember exactly, but she wanted to have that sort of move out of the house experience, live on your own experience, and so she moved in with us. We became a dormitory at this point. I became an RA at 31 years old to this young girl named Becca who moved into our house, and she, we, uh, we love her. She's a niece of Stacy's. It was wonderful. A uh, cousin, I'm sorry. And uh, anyways, um, not long after she moves in with us, uh, a beau from church, a, a young man from church starts wooing her, if you know what I mean. And uh, next thing you know, this kid named Nick is at my house all the freaking time. I'm like, Nick, what are you doing? And we love Nick. Nick's parents go to this church. We love them. Um, and his parents are kind of like older siblings to Stacy and I. And Nick was kind of like a younger sibling to us. And so it's like one big family thing. And, and we had this rule. It's like, Nick, when, when Stacy and I go to bed, you gots to go. 
Because we don't want you fooling around doing what I know you're a Christian, right? But I know hormones. Say amen, somebody. <laughs> so one Sunday night, Nick is lingering. He's in love. You could see it, dude. It was gross. It was, <laughs> he's in love with this young girl named Beth. We love it. And uh, so anyways, we say, Nick, uh, Stacy and I are going to bed. You got to go. And I actually wasn't feeling well that night. So I took a double dose of NyQuil. Anyone? Double dose of NyQuil, went to bed, and... Um, uh, thought nothing of it, right? The next morning, I got this told to me. This is what happened next, just so you know. Um, sometime in the middle of the night, after Nick had left, driving home on a cold winter night, he hit a, a patch of ice on a curve in the road down by the dam of the lake and careened off of the road and down into a ditch. And fortunately, this is the day of cell phones. He called his mom and dad. They called an ambulance. They rushed him to the emergency room. And yet they still have two young kids at home in bed getting to have to sleep in and get ready for school the next day. So the, his parents called me and Stacy and says, would you mind coming over to watch our children while we go to the emergency room with Nick? And um, I have no memory of this conversation, <laughs> right? Have two double shots of NyQuil. I have no idea. This is what they told me happened next. Um, Stacy got up and says, I will help you. I will go and she'll, she goes to the house and sits with the kids, helps them get ready for school the next day while they go and attend for Nick in the uh, hospital. Um, I say all that to say this. Sometimes you get a call in the middle of the night and you're ready for it or you're not. And I was obviously not ready for that phone call. I was of no assistance to my friends who needed me. Praise God for Stacy. Say amen, right? That she was a, wow. <laughs> So that seemed a little bitey, I'm just saying. We like her, yes, but you like her more than me. Yeah. <laughs> me too, me too. Uh, so, so anyways, this parable speaks to kind of a moment like that where some people are kind of caught unaware in the middle of the night, if you will. And um, what I want to do is just tell us a, a few things that Jesus is discussing. This, these two little parables come on the heels of a greater narrative or discussion that Jesus is having with his followers and disciples. Earlier, he'd been talking to them about um, not being hypocrites, say amen to that. We shouldn't be hypocrites. Church people shouldn't be hypocrites. Christ followers should not be hypocrites. And he warns his disciples to not, not be hypocritical in the way that they live their lives. He warns his disciples about coveting and being greedy and just hoarding onto possessions when other people are in need and, and trying to find your sustenance and maybe even your, your reason for living and all of the things that you possess. And he also worries them to, or, or tells his disciples not to be worriers or fearful about tomorrow. And, and all of these things are culminating in this little moment here with the disciples. And he gives them these two parables. And it, it would help us just to understand that Jesus seems to be intimating a way for people, his followers, to not be worrisome and fearful, to not covet things and, and hoard onto um, material possessions, and to not be hypocrites, is to be future minded. Is to always be looking towards something, a day, a moment, when something is going to happen. And if we keep our mind focused on the future, then we don't focus on the here and now, and we can um, not uh, be troubled by these things. Are you tracking with me? And this is, appears to be what Jesus is leaning into. So in these two parables, we see uh, some characters. We see some servants, and we see a master of a house. And, and the context of the first parable is that this servant leaves the house and he goes to, or this master rather, leaves the house and goes to a wedding feast. And, and in the first century in the Middle East, a wedding feast oftentimes could be a, a couple day affair. It for sure was more than just a couple hours on a Saturday afternoon. And, and so this master leaves for this, this wedding feast, which is an event. And um, there's a ceremony, there's a celebrating and, and feasting, yay. And when the, the master of the house left, he, he left the attendance of his home to his servants to the people that were responsible for maintaining the house. And in his absence, they should be watching for him and be mindful of when he's going to return so they can make the house ready for him when he comes back. The issue is they don't know when he's coming back. Some weddings go a long time, right? Second watch of the night, third watch of the night. I don't know. Jesus made wine, water from wine or wine from water. How'd it go? And, and did that at some wedding, you can imagine that one went late into the night. They're having a lot of fun. They're celebrating with this young couple that's getting married. And what's interesting about this whole 
And these two whole parables is that some people think that as, as uh, Jesus is describing this here in verse 35, he tells his, his servants, um, the master's servants, to stay dressed for action and to, to keep your lamps burning. We don't do lamps now, we do light switches and this and that. But you understand the concept, right? That lamps that require oil have to be filled with oil and the, the wicks have to be trimmed and there's just work to, to maintain these things. And if you want the house to be lit when the master comes home, it means you can't just sit on your hands and do nothing while he's away. You have to be doing something. And he says, stay dressed for action. Some of you maybe read a translation that says, gird your loins. Anyone? Gird your loins. What is that about? I'd love to tell you. Sometimes in the first century, they wear these long robes, if you will. And, and if you wanted to move quickly around, they would have to sort of hike up their long robes. And they would tie them around with this belt. This, they called it a girdle. is a weird thing. And they would tie their, their long robes into these belts. And that's what they mean by girding their loins. And it just means be ready to move quickly. This is not a time to put on your pajamas, turn the lights off, and go to bed, somebody. That the master is away, and at any moment, he's going to return, and you need to be watching for him. In verse 37, it says, Blessed are those servants who the master finds awake when he comes back. And it says this, an interesting flip. This is the upside-down kingdom that Jesus has been talking about with his disciples. That when the master walks in, he actually will not demand that his servants serve him, but he himself will gird himself and serve those who were ready for him. The master will serve the servants, and he will come and serve them. Verse 38, even if he comes in the second watch or the third watch, it just means that late at night or in the middle of the night, like after midnight, one, two, three o'clock in the morning, you know, blessed are those servants who are watching for him. It's, and he, he gives this little uh, analogy here. He says, if, if you knew when a thief was coming to break into your house, you'd never leave, would you? You'd never leave. If you knew the hour that a thief was coming, you would be armed and ready for him. And he goes, that's the idea that we need to, to be. Verse 40, and he says, so you must be ready, disciples. You must be ready, followers of Jesus. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. What a strange sentence. The Son of Man is a, an Old Testament prophetic name for the Messiah, the anointed one. Jesus is the Messiah. Say amen, yes. And he sometimes uses that phrase, the Son of Man, to speak about himself. And he's looking to his disciples and saying, you don't know when he's coming. And the disciples are going, bro, you're right here. <laughs> like, he's speaking to a future moment. We know the end of the story. Between here and this moment, there's a cross. Jesus would hang on the cross and he would die for the sins of the world. They would take his broken, beaten, bloodied body laid into a tomb. And on the third day, he would raise from the dead. Woo, who, somebody. It was weak. Weak, weak, yes. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. He's with his disciples, but for a short period of time. And then he tells them, I'm going to leave, giving you all the Holy Spirit. Say, thank you, God. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. And I'm going back to the Father in heaven. Jesus leaves, but he promises one day to return. If you read the book of Revelation, the end of that book, it talks about the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, will one day return again. And here in Luke chapter 12, there's this intimation, this hint at that moment. And the disciples' minds are just going, wait, what? You're going to leave and come back? Yes. Yes, I'm going to leave and come back. And you have to be ready. Verse 41, Peter asks this question, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And Jesus, just like George Washington, the character that Nate Bargatze played on SNL, anyone? When he gets asked the question, does anyone know this story? Have you seen this? He goes, Even for, for uh, free, all people will be free, right, George? And he just ignores the question. If you know what I'm talking about, if you've seen the skit, this is what Jesus does, just ignores the question. If you don't know the skit, it's okay. I understand. He just, Jesus doesn't even answer the question. What Peter's asking, is this for all of us, Lord, or is this just for Christian ministers? Is this for us, the disciples, the 12, the ones that you've been teaching, right, the students of yours, the, that you've been tutoring us? Or is this for all the crowds that are gathered around? And Jesus goes, mm, and just moves on, verse 42. He says, well, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed, he said, is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he returns. 44, truly I say to you, he will set him over all of his possessions. Can you say all? The master has some way of benefiting or blessing those who are ready for his return. And he gives them all the possessions. 
And the, but what if, verse 45, and this is sort of what happens if the servant just gets tired of waiting? Well, let's ask. Let's see what happens because Jesus addresses it. What if the servant says to himself, verse 45, my master is delayed in coming. He's not coming back. It's been a couple days. Who knows when he'll be? And what if he starts to mistreat the other servants? What if he starts to eat and drink and get drunk? Sounds like Friday night, somebody. What if all those things, right, happen? Well, then the master of the servant will come on the day when he does not expect him and at the hour that he does not know, and he will what? Cut him to pieces and put him with the unfaithful. Treat him like an unbeliever or an unfaithful person is what it says. Verse 47, and the servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready for it or act according to his will, he will receive a severe beating. I don't like passages like this in Scripture. It it appears to us that Jesus is saying that the master will find the, the servant unworthy of the blessing and will punish him for it because of his unwillingness to engage in the wait and the watch. And it says 48, and there's also a person who didn't even know about all this. He didn't know the master was away. He didn't know anything, right? And they also weren't ready. But he says this in 48, but the one who did not know and did did what deserved a beating, right? Because he wasn't ready for the master when he comes back. He's going to receive a light beating. Oh, thanks, Lord. Yeah, whatever. Only hit him twice. I don't know what that means. And then here's that real famous passage in Scripture. Everyone to whom much was given of him, much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. What a wild passage. Again, there's so much in there. Um, Some scholars think that when Jesus is giving these parables, they're talking about just the the brevity of life. That um, death can come like a thief sometimes when you least expect it. You know, all of us have had loved ones, family members, um, in the years that you've been alive where someone was just taken, like you get the message on Facebook or see it on Facebook or you get a call that so-and-so has passed away and you're just shocked by it. Yes, anyone, right? And it just happens quickly. Some scholars think that maybe Jesus is saying, hey, so everyone needs just to be ready for when um, death comes to you. And, And that could be taught from this passage and that's probably true and it's helpful to understand that. I think that is true. We should all pay attention. Our life is brief. Death will come for all of us. It is appointed unto a man once to die and then to face judgment, the Bible tells us. And yet, this, this whole section of parables seems to have a, um, a, a different type of uh, undertone in it as well. It appears that some scholars think that this is talking more about not just someone's um, individual accounting before they die, but it seems to emphasize uh, watchfulness and accountability, which have these sort of wait for it, eschatological concerns. That's a fun word to say. Eschatological. Eschatology. Eschatology. Anyone? Eschatology? Right? Eschatology comes from the Greek words, the study of last things. Or here, wait for it. Here's my favorite. The study of the end times. Now everybody lean in. (laughs) Is Jeff really going to talk about the end times? I just might. (laughs) Stay awake. You'll find out. You know, we have to at least consider this. There seems to be, with Jesus talking about treasures in heaven, standing before the angels of men, and and some other things that this whole passage seems to be pointing to a future moment when all things will be made new, when Christ returns and sets up his new heavens and his new earth. It appears that this does have an eschatological moment to that. And if that's true then it is pointing to a vigilance that we all should have as this crisis of the end times comes before us. So Luke here is zooming in on his disciples, and there's no doubt still crowds following after the people. Um, Peter asks that wonderful question, Lord, is this for us or for all of them? And to be honest with you, it's probably for both. Joel Green writes this in his commentary that he doesn't want people to dismiss his words entirely as irrelevant to them because this is just for church leaders. Hear me, this is church leader stuff. This is for us, the people who work at a church, who take their paycheck from the church. I'm a pastor in a church. This matters to me, but it matters to you too because Jesus was not quick to dismiss it just for the leaders in the church. This matters to you. Everyone has a call from God on their life, whether you're working in a church or not. There's a piece of God's puzzle that he's working out on the earth that you play a part in. Say amen to that. You you have a role in this. And so all of these words matter to you. The issue, and this is where I stand, is that too often Christians spend all kinds of good energy 
and good motives debating and defending their opinions on what is called the second coming of Christ instead of paying attention to what he's actually saying. And so if you'll give me but a free uh, moment or two, I'd like to just talk about four orthodox positions. Orthodox meaning this, they're true, they're biblical, that we would call people who believe in these different viewpoints brothers and sisters in Christ, okay? Um, And they all seem to, all these different viewpoints on the end times or the uh, second coming of Christ, it seems to sort of hinge around, their differing opinions seem to hinge on this one verse in, uh, here we go, Revelation chapter 20. I don't have the verse up here for you. I'm going to read it to you because it's awesome. This is uh, Jesus. He's speaking to John the Revelator, and John is writing things down, so to speak. Um, and and uh, so John says, says this in, in chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. It's kind of like them wallet chains is how I picture it. I have no idea what it looks like. And this, this person seized the dragon, the ancient serpent. What a great line. Who is the devil and Satan and bound him for 1,000 years. Years, or it says for a thousand years. And so, this one time in Revelation that this thousand years is mentioned has created four different Orthodox positions in what the second coming of Christ looks like. And here they come. Are you ready for them? The first one is this amillennialism. Say it with me now. Blah, 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 blah. Amillennialism. Yes. (laughs) This. This view, they all have millennial in their name. So it's a thousand years. All millennialists take the thousand year reign mentioned in chapter 20 to be figurative, not literal. So hang on, right? They they think it speaks to the church age. So when Jesus came to earth as a baby in a manger and did his ministry and died on a cross, he ushered in the kingdom of God. And we currently now live in the church age, they would say. So we are in the figurative 1,000 years. And at some point at the end of this 1,000 years, Jesus will return in the second coming. Okay, there's the first one. But just know this, all these four positions, I'm telling you right now, they all believe in these three things. Number one, they all believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Say amen if you agree. Amen. Yes, they all believe in the resurrection of the dead. Say amen if you agree. Yes. And they all agree in a final judgment. All of them agree in that. They just differ on the 1,000 years and all of that. So all millennialists millennialists believe that we're in the church age, the 1,000 years now, figuratively. (sighs) Calm down. Post-millennials, uh, post after the millennium, they also have this belief that Christ will return after a golden age called the millennium in which the world will become predominantly Christian over theonomy. We can talk about all that later. But just as Christians sort of take charge and, and become salt and light to the earth, the earth becomes transformed. And at some point, the church continues to grow and be more Christian, more Christian, more Christian. This golden age erupts on the earth. And at the end of that, Jesus will return and bring the final judgment and a new creation. Say amen. Woo! Number three, shout out for yours. If I said yours yet, just let me know. Any amillennials? Don't raise your hand. Postmillennials? Don't raise your hand. Okay, here we go. Historic premillennial. Ooh, we're getting close here, guys. I like this one. It says, this view teaches that Christ will return after a period of tribulation. Say tribulation. Tribulation, yes. At which point the believers will be resurrected. Some would say raptured. This is the idea of the rapture in the church. And they will reign with Christ on the earth for a literal 1,000-year reign before comes a final judgment. So it's a pretty popular um, belief here. And this last one, I'm going to suspect most people will go, mm-hmm, that's my jam right here. This is one I like. I'm feeling this one. And if you're, if you're that, you are called a dispensational premillennialist. That's fun to say. You just thought you were weird. No, you're a dispensational premillennialist. Right? This is who we are. This is what we think. This view holds that Christ will return first to rapture the believers before a seven-year tribulation, say tribulation, after which he will return to establish a 1,000 literal year reign on earth, followed by the final defeat of Satan and evil and the judgment of all. Amen. Amen. Right? Now, I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess that most of us probably fall into the dispensational premillennial category, Right? Nobody wants to raise their hands. It is totally fine. Yes, if you read the Left Behind books, raise your hands, right? If you watch the movies, this is that, this one's, this is that. I'm a Pentecostal. This is sort of my stream of Christianity. This is the one they sort of believe in. This is where we go, okay? Um, We parse out some of the details later, whatever. Want to hear what I learned this week? Do you know how many people, of all the Christians in the world, the percentage of people that believe in the dispensational pre-trib, pre-millennial view, you know what percentage it is of all the Christians in the world? 
15, 20%. What? We would think most people, most Christians would believe this one because that's the one we probably believe, yes? They don't. Most Christians actually believe the amillennial root, right? That we're in the church age now. It is a figurative 1,000-year reign. These brothers and sisters in Christ, there are brothers and sisters, yes, right? These would be the Lutherans, the Anglicans, the Roman Catholics. They're not Christians. They are, if they believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, right? Uh, the Presbyterians, some of the Methodists are amillennial. Any amillennials in the room? Nobody wants to raise their hand. That's okay. Hear this. We debate countless hours and energy over the finer points of these four different views than we actually do about listening to the words of Jesus in the parables. What is the purpose of the parables? Watch and be ready. Watch and be ready. I literally watch hours of YouTube videos at night. My wife is like, please go to bed. Of watching these debates over all of these things. Who thinks these debates are fun? Am I the only one? They're like, it's not fun. Who, who has time for this? I think it's great. I think it's great. I love seeing people debate the different finer points of their different views, right? And here's, here's I watched a video the other day. A guy said something about his view. He goes, I'm firmly convinced that my view is right, right? As I am, just so you know. I'm just not telling you which one's mine, <laughs> right? But I'm okay to be wrong. I'm okay to be wrong. And, and maybe one day we'll find out we were wrong. Ugh. Are you guys okay with me? Should I start over? <laughs> That's a big setup to get to this point. This is all I want to say. I'm so sorry it took so long. And too often Christians spend so much good energy and good motives debating, defending, and setting up their opinions on the second coming of Jesus, and they don't focus on the point he's making. Be ready. R.C. Sproul writes this, that when he, Jesus, comes those who are found ready, who are busily engaged in their work, having their hearts set not or on the kingdom of God and not on the acquisition of material possessions, they will be rewarded, he says. So the question for us in the last few moments that we have together, what is the work that God would have for us? What is this work or duty that Jesus asks? What are we to do while we wait for him to return? What does he expect us to do? Let me just say this. Let's remember that this story describes servants as rulers of the master's household. So when the master left, who was in charge? The servants. And if this story is a parallel of Jesus having returned to heaven, waiting for one day to return again, which we all believe, yes, that he's coming again. Praise God, yes, he is coming again. But we as his servants have been left in charge. It's a terrifying thought. And I don't just mean the church, capital C church, is in charge. Like, we as the church are in charge while he's away. Under Christ's lordship, amen, amen, yes. But we have been given things to do. And what does a faithful service and a stewardship emphasize? How do we emphasize that in our lives? I'm glad you asked. I've got a few things to talk about, and then we'll go watch football. First one is this, is we proclaim the gospel until he returns. We proclaim the gospel. It just means this. We tell people the story of God's son, Jesus Christ. The good news. That's what gospel means. It is good news for the world. How many people think the world needs to hear the gospel? How many people think people need good news in the world around us? Yes, say that. Yes, we agree. We, should we be people that preach the gospel? Yes, of course we should. We should always proclaim. Here's a very famous passage in Matthew chapter 28. It says this, Jesus speaking to his disciples. Before he sends to heaven, he says, Go then and make disciples of all the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, he says, Teach them to observe everything that I have commanded you, and behold, I will be with you always. Until the end of the age, I will be with you. Even though I'm away, I am with you with the Holy Spirit. Evangelism and making disciples is a central responsibility of us. St. Francis of Assisi has been um, coined as saying that we should preach the gospel at all times and if you must use words. Have you ever heard that statement? You know, you can preach the gospel just living your life in front of people with salt and light. If you have to use words, by all means, use words, but just be a gospel person. Are you guys mad at me? I just want to know, because I'll just walk off. I don't care. Um, <laughs> number two, we're going to care for one another. We're going to have fellowship and accountability, just as stewards are responsible for caring for the household of, 
Um, the, the master, the church is tasked with the spiritual and the physical, physical care of its members. This hit me like a ton of bricks this week. We need to provide for the needs of others with charity, benevolence, support in times of trouble. Do you know how many people are going through a really tough time right now in this room, right now, in this room? And for us as the church to just come in to make, to make the dent in our common seat that we sit in every week, say amen, somebody. To not even reach down the aisle to say, how are things, bro? How is your week, bro? How are things going? I mean, without even like looking, glancing at another person, that somehow you've done your duty to come to church, you're missing the point of church. That we have a role, a responsibility to one another to help and to assist. And I need to say this for some people in the room, I'm convinced that this is gonna help. You've been asking the Lord for help in your current situation. It's been a while. I don't know what your thing is, but you're stuck in it. It's as if you're marching through knee-deep mud. You seem to make some traction, but seem to fall down more than you stand up. You are struggling, and every once in a while, in the deepest, darkest moments of your life, you cry out to God for help, and he is telling you, this is what the Lord would say to you, I have given you help. It is the church that you're going to, and you just come occasionally. And when you come, you come late. And you don't look down the aisle of your road. You don't in, get to know anyone. So how can you possibly ask, for more, ask me for help when I've given you help in the room that you're sitting in? That's a real statement, guys. I'm an introvert. I'm, I'm worse than that. I'm a shy introvert. When I went to churches and they did that meet and greet time, go turn around and say hi to your neighbors, I ran out the room. Right? And so the Lord told me, those people can pray for you and deliver you from the things that you're struggling with. And the little shell, the little wall that I built up to protect myself from those people had to come down so that I could actually get the care and the love that God has given me through the people in the room. Care for one another. That's how you be busy about the Lord's work, waiting for his return. Number two, you live a holy, or number three, you live a holy life. Christian servants are called to live in obedience and holiness as we wait for his return. We are instructed to be the lights of the world, employing the values of the kingdom of God. Look what it says here in 1 Peter chapter one. But as he who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all of your conduct. Say all. We live in a way that reflects the character of Christ. And this is not just about our own sanctification as God is purifying us, but this also serves as a witness of the, to the world of God's transformative power. Back to that statement, preach the gospel at all times, and if you must, use words. But you know what's better? Your changed life. Jeff used to be a whole lot more fun, they would say. We used to go out to strip clubs and drink all night. I never went to strip clubs. That's what they said. I don't know what you're thinking. That's who I was. <laughs> I am many things, but that was not one. But God changed my life. And, and that two o'clock hour in the morning just had no draw on me anymore. My parents always used to say, there's nothing good happening after midnight. Anyone? How many people have been told that or say that to your own kids now? There's nothing good happening after midnight. I promise you. Unless it's a 24-hour worship night or something. I don't know. He says, we should also, number four, use our gifts in service. The parable of the servants and the stewards alludes to this using of the resources, the time and the gifts that God has entrusted us to serve the church, to serve one another. First Peter chapter four says, each has received a gift and use it to serve one another as God's stewards of God's varied grace. This includes ministry in the church and maybe outside of it. But I'll tell you right now, we, we, we need a lot of volunteers to run a Sunday morning. We need teachers. We need Sunday school class teachers. We need band people. If you play electric guitar, we'll give you a $1,000 check today if you sign up to play. <laughs> Ryan, where are you at? He's like, is there really pay? It does not. Sorry, that was a joke. <laughs> like, we need people to help. And I, I've, I've beaten this drum as much as I can. So if you come to Renaissance and this is your home church, I apologize for what I'm about to say. But hear me when I say this. 
Like my life was so utterly transformed when I stopped just spectating. When my mind shifted from being a consumer of the church, you know what I'm talking about? Where they just, like, I hope the worship is good when I go into that. I hope, I hope Jeff ain't preaching or I hope Jeff is preaching. I don't know where your persuasion is, right? I hope it's this, I hope it's this. Like, and you're just consuming the, the material or the, the, the benefits that the church produces. When my mind shifted from that idea to actually engaging, or as John Hockaday reminded me this morning, of getting in the game, like, get in, bro. Let's play. Let's go. When you join the work, when I joined the work, my, my life changed. I'm, I don't know how to explain it. Like, I was saved. The Holy Spirit was in me. But when I connected with other people and we we disciplined ourselves to be on time at church because we were in the band together or I had to serve with kids. I don't like kids. I got to go serve kids, right? And but like, and God is, sh- I have two. It's okay, I can say that. I like my kids. I like my kids. I can say that. I don't work in elementary, guys. I'm just telling you right now, right? But when we, when we learn to do some of those things and God begins to just shape and, and hewn our rough edges and start saying things like this, God, he says, I didn't send my son to be served, but to serve. And if I'm transforming you into the image of my son, then you gotta learn to serve or you're, or wait for it, or you're in rebellion. Jeff, I've been a Christian an awful long time. I don't really need to serve in a church anymore. Yeah, believe that lie if you want. Right? And then carry the weight of the, I have a a scroll of names I could roll out that would stretch across this room of the people who are upset that I didn't meet all of their needs. And yet we're filled to the, to the brim. There's a few empty seats in here. And, and God could use every one of you to meet their needs so they don't rely only on me or the staff. But no, you stay out. Let us do all of it. So when they get upset, they're not upset at you. They're upset at us. I mean, you don't have, no, 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 no. I'm not mad. Like, I've worked through this. I have a therapist and everything. It's cool. <laughs> I promise you, I promise you, it sounded harder than it was. It is not. If you have this idea that you just come and sit and come and sit, I'm telling you, you will be this big always in your faith. When God God uses you to pray for someone's need and you're terrified because you might screw it up, like you might, like my wife's in the hospital. This is their story, let's say. And, and then she needs a miracle. And bro, would you pray for me? And you're like, oh God, anyone but me. But the Lord's like, tag, you're it. You're it. And the Holy Spirit goes, it's time. And the Spirit inside of you says, it's time. And you stand up with quaking hands. You put your hand on their shoulder and you begin to pray in faith and trust that God is good. And this situation is just but a quagmire that they're stuck in and God could fix it and do something and you're going to bring it to be by praying. And you walk out of here thinking that you failed. What a stupid prayer that was. What a dumb thing you said. I can't believe you misplaced, you said her name was Stacy. It's Stephanie, dummy. And the next week you come in and they meet you at the door and they said, when you prayed for my wife, she called and she got better. She came home on Tuesday. And all of a sudden, like you're growing. Is anyone resonating with any of this? You don't have to do this. Just sit. Just sit. If it makes you feel better, write a check and put it in the box. That stung a little bit. <laughs> but it's true. Because those, those of us who can write the check to not feel guilty can do that all day long. And the Lord would say, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I do not need your bills. That rhymes. That's cool. I, this church, hear me, will be fine without your money. Stacy just yelled at me from downstairs. <laughs> God will meet our needs. Amen. He wants you to grow. Lastly, this is what Luke chapter 12, verse 40 says. You also must be ready 
for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. He's coming, guys. We can parse out the details, premillennial, postmillennial, whatever. Have your camps. I'm fine with your camps. To be truthful, I'm probably in your camp. We ain't mad at each other. But to me, that ain't the deal, man. It's be watchful. He's coming again. Say amen. He's coming again, and we need to be watching and ready for him. So we spread the gospel. We care and support for one another. We live holy and obedient lives. We use our gifts in service to one another in the church, and we stay watchful and prepared. R.C. J.C. Ryle rather writes this, and I'm closing here. You guys are okay. He says, the standard of all of this, which our Lord has set up here, is an exceedingly high one. Amen? What a high bar, oh God, this is. In fact, many of us are apt to flinch from it and to feel cast down and wait for what he says. And yet there is nothing here which ought to make a believer afraid. And this is what I underline and hear me when I say this. Readiness for the return of Christ to this world implies nothing which is impossible and unattainable. Everything that I mentioned, you can do. Everything that I've mentioned, God is inviting you to par- participate in. Your move. It's your move. Shall we pray? <laughs> or throw stones? It's up to you. Ah, <laughs> oh, so good. Hey, I have a lot of resources, if at all anybody cares about the, the intricacies of those debates on those end times. I have lots of books. I will loan them out to you if you want to look at them. Um, You don't have to. So just find me after service. Um, I'll get you a library card to my library and we'll get, get you started. So let's pray together, can we? Lord, we'll make it about anything and everything that it's not about. And we'll use, we'll use all the reasons to, 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 to feign some offense to not get involved. Whatever it takes, Lord, to not do the work that you set before us. But in Jesus' name, I pray, Holy Spirit, come and just knock down those lies. Just knock it down. God, you have a good plan for each and every person. Deliverance ministry that will deliver people from addictions, that will restore marriages and relationships are are needing to be birthed in this church. And Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is looking for those who will say, I can go for you, put me in. I can go. I will be a servant in this church. I will pray with faith for people who need prayer. I will serve those who need to be served. God has huge plans for the ministry of this church and it will not come to pass, will not come to pass if only a few people do the work. It is not the intent that God has for his church. And so God, we ask that you would awaken all of us from what we might say is a slumber. Many of us caught the fire of salvation years ago, filled with the spirit, speak in tongues, do all that Pentecostal good stuff, Lord God. But we have grown dim in our fire for the Lord. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would blow across the dying embers and flan them into flames once again. Make us to be the people we once were again. On fire for the things of God, game changers at our employers, game changers with our neighborhood, the people that we, that, that, uh, that others call when they have a need. Let us be those people, oh God. We thank you, God, that you are not finished with us. Until the last breath is drawn from us, God, you are able to bring us all into this ultimate reality. We ask, God, that you would do that even now. Awaken us, oh God. Bring us into your place. Bring us into this new understanding. We love you, Lord. But for those of you that are in a place of hurt and in a place of need, I beg you, please talk to the person sitting by you. Please. Please ask the Lord to just highlight a, someone that you can just say something to on your way out the door because they, God has placed in them the thing that you need. It's there for you, please. God, we love you. We ask that you bless our time. 
this rest of the day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.